The reason for this season is not trees. It's not even presence under the tree. It's the present that died on the tree. The reason for this season is not reindeer. It's not hot chocolate. It's not Christmas decoration. Jesus did not come to give us a holiday. He came to give us a holy life. He came to give us, give us a new life. He came to give us brand new life. In fact, I'm going to read to you what the angel told Mary. He said in Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, he says, She will give birth to a son and you will name him a savior. For he is destined to give his life to save his people from their sins. If you are celebrating this holiday, I want to let you know that today it's being monetized it's being commercialized today it's it's a huge money-making machine and God bless all the people working the USPS FedEx and UPS I just want to say a quick prayer Lord bless them and their families because I you do know that we ordered more than we probably should have on Amazon this season <laughs> but this season has become really about sales family and everything the first birth of Jesus was never about that. Jesus came on this earth not so that you can celebrate his birth. It's so that heaven can celebrate yours. It's so that heaven can celebrate your second birth. If you're celebrating his birth but heaven has not celebrated your second birth, you're missing the whole point. Now still enjoy the music still enjoy the the holiday spirit still enjoy the the chocolate still do all of that stuff but I want to let you know you missed the whole point I've never trembled as much as I tremble today about what I'm about to preach um, I don't remember the last time that I was this scared to preach what I'm about to preach from five o'clock in the morning until now my heart is racing three four times faster and I've preached at least a, maybe a thousand times that's recorded on, the, on my phone and so um, I had a different message planned and my team knows by Thursday I already have my notes and uh, this morning as I woke up to pray for the service I really felt a shift um, in my heart to preach something different not necessarily just for the people that are here or watching but for the people that will be re-watching I want to speak about today a message that will be titled hell has no exits I might ruin your Christmas appetite but that's why the Christmas music did a good job <laughs> and there will be Christmas photos afterwards and so just hang in there for those of you who came to like man shoot the wrong Sunday to come to church or maybe you bought you brought a friend and don't, don't apologize to them yet if it's true that Jesus came to die for our sins not to make our life easier but to give us a new life I believe this is the message we need to be reminded of especially today I am tired of testimonies of salvation that go like this I was lonely Jesus made me feel better I uh, I was depressed Jesus lifted my spirit up you know God didn't send his son to be your Advil pill if God wanted to lift your mood he would have give us drugs he would have give us medicine Jesus did not come to make your mental state slightly better Jesus came to save his people not from their emotional drama but from their sins the purpose of Jesus' coming on this earth is that we were facing hopeless, irreversible, Christless eternity. There was no other way. This wasn't because God was trying to make our life better though it is true. Having Jesus makes you better at life and most likely it will make your life better. It is true. But for hundreds of years and millions of Christians, having Jesus in their life actually complicates and makes their life worse. 
for my great grand grandpa who sat in jail for years and then was dragged around the villagers and was killed not stoned because he got high stoned physically and died three days later from a brain damage he did not accept Jesus Christ to make his life better he accepted Jesus Christ because there was eternity at stake he was willing to forfeit the pleasures of this life. He was willing to forfeit the comforts of this world because he knew this life is just a vapor. It's just a crash. It's just a fleeing thing. There is three straight, three, three stages in our life. The first stage is the one in the womb. Somebody say the womb. All of us were there. You don't remember that stage. It lasted about nine months. Some of us got out earlier. Some of us stayed there slightly longer when you were in the womb you didn't see your mother but she existed it would be foolish to be an atheist in the womb who looks to your twin brother and say I don't believe my mother exists why I don't see her if I don't see her I don't believe in her and hopefully your twin brother will say idiot the reason why you don't see her is because she's scaring you no until I see I won't believe that's how a lot of people say well I don't believe in God why I don't see God the Bible says in Him we live, we move and we have our being. If there will be no God, there will be no you. So there's that stage. And when you graduate from the womb, when you graduate from the womb, there's a lot of crying. You crying, mama crying, everybody crying, some crying for tears, some crying because it's so painful and some crying because it's so beautiful but there's a lot of tears. And then you come into a bigger space. It's called the earth. Somebody say earth it's a bigger space you learn how to walk you learn how to live you learn the alphabet you go to school you graduate you have degrees you get married you have children of your own and then you you get retirement and th this earth is a bigger womb but it's still a womb because when you graduate from this womb there is also a lot of crying people crying on this side of eternity because they lost a loved one and people crying on the other side of eternity because they're so glad they're done with the earth everybody who had a visit to heaven they never wanted to come back to see their family in though, even though they love their family because it was so precious out there and so when we graduate the womb of the earth we go into this thing that has no end it's called the womb of eternity if you're taking notes I'm, i will give you just because i prepared at five o'clock in the morning it doesn't mean i don't have points the first thing i want you to write down is that everyone will exist eternally whether in hell or heaven. Ecclesiastes 3.11 it says this, also he has put eternity in their hearts. Eternity is not something you enter into when you die. Eternity is something you were born with. The moment you were born, you were born eternal. You were born one that will never cease to exist. You were born as such that even if you tap out of life and you take your life to end it, you only end the womb of the earth. You step into an eternity. You will, there will never be a time that you will not exist. You will always exist. Eternity He has put into their hearts. Jesus Christ in Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 it says, Many who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. John 3.16 is the famous verse that says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So that you will have a religion, go to church, pay your tithe, hopefully recover and one day, one day have a priest read your e eulogy on your funeral. That's not what it says. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish. But have what? Not better life. Not happier life. Not all my problems are fixed life. Not better husband. Not better children. Not better retirement. Not better job but have everlasting life. Meaning the reason why Jesus came on this dirty earth. The reason why he clothed himself with the human flesh. The reason why he who made legs learned to walk. He who created speech learned to speak. He who is the living water was thirsty for water. The reason why he who never sleeps or slumbers was tired and fell asleep on the boat. And the reason why he let humanity mock, pluck his beard, spit in his face and say prophesy to us. If you're the son of God come down from the cross. The reason he put up with all of that is because for God so loved the world 
that he gave him up for what? please hear me I know we're in America and I know we use Christianity as more of like it's gonna make my life better and it's true but the reason why he came is not for that it's to give you eternal life you already have eternal existence but Christ comes to give you eternal life you've seen this illustration multiple of times and this is this is your life right here is when your mama conceived you nine months later when you came out birth certificate said that over here that's when you were born and then there was this period of time when you went to school then you graduated you decided what you were doing for two years then you decided to go to college then you graduated from college you got a girlfriend you got married you decided to come back to church and then you were working this time so that you can enjoy this time you really were working safe for your retirement and then quickly you got retired and uh, you have about next 15 to 20 years left to enjoy and that is really your life this is where the headaches heartaches hang-ups hurts pains disappointments dealing with challenges having questions just broken dreams Th this is where it's at and then when you die at your funeral is where for 70 years 700 years a thousand years a million years another million another billion another billion but this is just about 200 feet unfortunately the robe of your eternity it never reaches the end billion we're not talking about 70 years we're not talking about seven years we're not talking about we're talking about billions it means your mind and my mind cannot comprehend because it's it's too small to comprehend eternity we have it in us we just can't understand it and then it goes more and more and more and more and more only now I understand why people would forfeit the pleasures of life in here to focus on where they're gonna spend and what they're gonna do in here it is foolish to focus on here and ignore the rest of the rope it is a gamble it is foolish to think that that's all to life there is and be worried about this part that's why everything in the Bible you will not understand Jesus Christianity and the scriptures if your whole world is wrapped in this you will never understand fasting tithing sacrificing loving your neighbors forgiving going on the missions inviting your neighbors waking up early to serve God giving up those bad habits that will never make sense why thousands of Christians got slaughtered this month in Nigeria beheaded for the cause of Christ like why would anybody endure that because they don't see this they also see that and they see total end it's why Jesus came not to make this better but to change the direction of the rest of this rope and if this is somehow bad if somehow you go through bankruptcy heartbreak sickness disease if somehow this life in here is yellow do not be concerned as long as the rest of it is white if this is sickness don't sweat over it as long as the rest of it is health if this is poverty do not concern yourself with it because as long as the rest of it is in a mansion if this is challenging and this is difficult as long as the rest of it I will wipe every tear from their eye and there will be no pain and there will be no sorrow as long as the rest of it is better my friend don't live your best life now the only people who live their best life now are those who are headed to hell your best life is coming your best life is still coming don't put all of your best life here and now your best life is awaiting you 
and everything that's now here is just an appetizer it's just a preview of what is coming can somebody say amen you don't decide if you will live forever you decide only where you will live forever say this with me say I don't decide if I will live forever I decide where I will live forever the second truth I want you to write down is everyone has only one life in which to determine their eternity there is no reincarnation. you're not coming back as a dog you're not coming back as a tree you're not coming back as a millionaire or you're not coming back as a clergy you only have one life the scripture says in Hebrews 9 27 it is appointed for man to die once but after this is the judgment Christ gives us a second chance but life does not give us a do-overs Christ gives us a second chance but life does not give us do-overs this is scary and it's one of the reasons I'm trembling it's because you really have only one chance to get it right Jesus made it simple and he said there are many ways to hell only one ways to heaven and he said I am that way you can't afford to be wrong there's many things in life you can't afford for example let's just say that you, you took a 12th uh, or 11th uh, grade you can go back and retake it you took a test most of the tests you can retake it if you're writing something on the document you can delete it and retype it if they made a wrong drink for you in the Starbucks they can remake it nowadays if you marry the wrong person people don't work out they just find a different one there's a lot of things in life you can get a do-over on except this one when it deals with your eternity people take risks I'm a risk taker I think you should be a risk taker but never with eternity when I would have a conversation with somebody who is agnostic or an atheist and I usually would tell them things I said I said the, the deal is this is you're such a you're taking such a huge ham, camp, uh, gamble if this is wrong if there is no eternity I didn't miss anything except a lot of sin a lot of headaches I lived better life because of Jesus he made me better at life but if this is not a joke which I don't believe it is because Jesus wouldn't come on this earth for a joke this is not a prank I said you have just lost the biggest gamble in your life and we're not talking about for 70 years where you can suffer in the maximum prison and then seven years later you come out we're not talking about a million years we're not talking about two billion years we're not talking about three trillion years there's a clock you can set it and you can endure the suffering and then at the end you come out if it has no end I will even if I wouldn't believe it I would still do it why because I don't like to gamble that imagine you are at the crossings and I think that a lot of us had those thoughts I studied uh, that during the railroad crossings there's a lot of accidents that happen and mainly because of pride and this is the pride that happens I can get through this <laughs> these little low bars uh, th these little flashing lights they're not for me they're for everybody else I have enough time because I watched it in the movies to get through it there is no do-overs for that there is no do-overs for that my friend this is not as bad as getting hit on by the train of eternity and I really want to encourage you the flashing light is here today God has put you to a stop don't go into the next day of your life without surrendering your life to Jesus Christ can somebody say amen number three Jesus spoke more about hell than anyone else in the scriptures this may shock you that hell is mentioned 162 times in the New Testament and Jesus preached on hell 70 times in a three and a half year span period 
that tells me that no other author in the Bible has taught more on hell eternal damnation than Jesus Christ you would think when we think of Jesus most of us think of Christmas we think of gifts and that's why even maybe some of you are listening to this right now you're like man this is not a holiday spirit this Jesus did not get sent on this earth and all he just only talked about love once a month you would come to Jesus's meeting and he would talk about this uncomfortable message on hell now in 2011 is the first time at hungry gen we started to do prayer line prayer line we did it with the anointing water not the holy water that's what Catholics do anointing water is slightly different we would pray for people people would manifest and get delivered a year after that 2012 is when we had our famous revival with the wise man Harry at the track conference so that is about nine years ago is when we started to do monthly deliverance services if you've been in our church any time more than few months you know one thing our church has this weird Sunday where most of you are like I don't want to bring my non-Christian friends there why I just never know and then you bring your crazy friends on that in that service why because you're like they'll understand like they'll understand that's for them what is that it's called our deliverance Sunday next Sunday is gonna be that Sunday it's when we pray for deliverance demons come out deliverance is very controversial in Christian circles not very controversial in Hollywood but just in Christian circles deliverance is, is messy deliverance is, is, is dirty deliverance is uh, you know it threw me under the bus in some Christian circles when we start practicing deliverance I stopped getting invited in some circles I start being called with a certain name in fact even our church has a label in a lot of circles that that's the that's the demon church why because once a month without fail for nine years last Sunday of the month we out 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 now Jesus once a month without fail for three years had hell 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 if you would hang out around Jesus once a month you would hear a message on hell what deliverance is to hungry gen the topic of hell was to Jesus if you think that Jesus only talked about love your neighbor hit another cheek pick up the, the load just forgive just the, I want to tell you something study your Bible because not one author in the Bible has talked more about hell than Jesus Christ and in fact he didn't talk about a generic just like a just a bad place he didn't use it as a cuss word he talked about it in a vivid detail because he was involved in his design he used four different words for hell first one is Sheol which is a Hebrew word simply talking about the grave or death for in death there is no remembrance of you in the grave who will give you thanks Psalm 6 5 that speaks about hell Hades is the second term it's a Greek term that usually refers to hell and being in torments in Hades he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham and off Lazarus in his bosom Luke chapter 16 verse 24 and Hades refers to a waiting period of the torment for the ungodly and the place of paradise for the righteous and Jesus when he went to when he died he went to Hades and took the believers in Abraham's bosom up to heaven we believe that now the third the third definition of word hell is Gehenna it's a Greek term borrowed from a little dumping burning dump in the valley south of Jerusalem that always refers to hell this garbage dump had felt dead animals dead criminals fires constantly burned in it worms worked really hard and dog gnashed their teeth when they were eating raw flesh so that's one of the reasons why a lot of the description for hell is actually comes from a cosmic garbage dump behind Jerusalem where pretty much they didn't have waste management like we do or a basin disposal where they pick up our garbage what you would do is there was this dump you came and you would throw anything that was unfit to live in your house food or rotten things people would throw dead animals somebody died in a prison nobody came to take their body they would just dump it there and so worms would eat the body dogs would come and growl at night and gnash their teeth over things and then people would come and set the fire so that the contamination and the viruses won't spread so they would burn those things that's why the terminology was used from that place fires will never die worms will never die and there will be gnashing of teeth 
and the last reference of hell is the lake of fire. It's the final abode of all unbelievers after they've been resurrected. Then Hades and death were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, Revelation 20, 19. I want to let you know that hell is not for really bad people. It's the default destination of all humans. Let me say that again. Hell is not for super bad people. It's the default destination of every human being. By default, you don't go to heaven. By default, in Adam, we are headed right there. Most of us think of hell as a maximum sentence prison. It's where all the Jack the Reaper, the, 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 all these murderers, serial killers like Hitler, Osama bin Laden, Joseph Stalin. And then there's me. You know, like if, if you, we, we all sometimes make mistakes, drive over the speed limit. You don't go to maximum prison for that. Sometimes you, you know, miss the number on your taxes or you exaggerate something. It's not a big deal. And so when we think of ourselves, that's how many people think of heaven. And they're like, well, of course I'm a good person and I'm going to heaven. Of course I'm a good person. I will not go to hell because that is not for me. I mean, I gave to a guy at the Red Cross of, off of Walmart and Safeway a few days ago. Like I didn't do anything terrible. I'm not a bad guy. I'm a good person. I want to tell you something. Jesus came to save his people from their sins. That tells me every human being has fallen short of the glory of God and a default destination of every human being is not heaven, it's hell. Makes sense why he came to change the default destination. Number four, hell is a real place of conscious torment beyond description. Four things I want you to know about hell. Number one, we will be able to see there and being in torments in Hades, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. There is no phone reception there. There's no internet. But you will have your sight. Number two is you will be able to speak there. The scripture says, and Lazarus cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in his flame, in its flame. Number three, we will be able to feel there. The Bible says, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's talking about an emotions, weeping. There's two reasons we would gnash our teeth: in anger or regret. And both are gonna be the emotions that are going to be felt in hell. The Bible says, outer darkness not nobody in this room has ever experienced outer darkness the darkness we experience at night is not outer darkness because we have a moon and stars depression that you feel is not outer darkness because there's another human being and there's always the next day there's medicine there's therapists there's doctors there's people who can help you no matter how in despair you fall on this earth there's always a better day coming. When it comes to eternity, the darkness in eternity is so hopeless. It's full of loneliness and total despair. And the worst part is it never gets better. And you feel that darkness. Two months from now, a new friend of, of mine, uh, Bill, who had 23 minutes of visit in hell will be a guest speaker at Hungry Jet on February 21st. I heard his testimony, read his book, honestly shook me to the core about he's a Christian believer and then he had an experience. His whole life was changed after that and he quit his job now. He travels and tells everybody about this place that everybody should avoid. And not only will we be able to see, we'll be able to hear, we'll be able to feel, but the last one is we will be able to taste. The Bible says they were both cast into the fire, into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Brimstone is burning sulfur. Not only you, are, you and I will be subject to eternal damnation, if we're not Christians, in an exchangeable flames, but it also smells like rotten eggs. The worst part about hell as well is its smell. People who went to hell many times will tell you it smells like rotten eggs. 
it's a real place and from that place which is our default destination son of God became a son of man to save us from he didn't come to create a holiday he came to create holy people he came to give us eternal life and the last thing I want to share with you and we're going to pray hell was made by God for the devil Matthew 25 verse 41 it says this then he will also say to those on the left depart from me you cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels <laughs> little reminder or to summarize everything hell is a real place it's not a joke you know listening to something like this right now some of you may say well that's great and that's great but what you know it's not like you're exaggerating that's exactly what people were thinking when Noah was building the ark <laughs> come on bro we never seen the rain come on relax no it, it, it's fine until it's not raining that's exactly what it sounded like when Lot came into his relatives hey guys uh, the fire is gonna fall like from heaven and burn our cities down and his relatives looked at him they're like what the fire come on Noah are you okay do you need to see a therapist until this fire start coming down and the crazy part Jesus compared the last days to these two people Noah and Lot because the message of eternity will sound like a joke to a lot of people another quick reminder is that hell is horrible it's not a party contrary to popular opinion Satan doesn't rule hell God does for those people who are like well if the devil is going to be there that means I'm going to have all the sex all the beer I'm going to have a lot of fun if you want to have a party you should go to heaven hell is not where you go to party hell is a place where you go to get punished hell was never created for a human being it was created for Satan when God designed hell he did not plan for human beings to be there let me just give an example when they design cars they don't design cars to be driven by dogs <laughs> if you see a dog driving a car something is wrong with that picture why because cars were not designed to be driven by by dogs or cats cars were designed to be driven by human beings that's exactly the same thing with eternal hell is the hell was never designed to be inhabited by humans it was designed to be inhabited by satan and by demons and that's why god wants to do everything in his power to stop us from that hell is eternal and it has no exits during worship i was counting how many exits this building has and i think we have 12 exits in fact in this building we, it's required by the law that you see the exits in case the lights go off you can right now see there is one there is two there is three there's also a sign that is not lit up it's just a paper sign it says exit and you're probably sure there's one over there on the on the exit that is over there and so there's exits in every building so you don't feel trapped the shocking part about hell is it has no windows no attics and it has no exits it's a trap it's an eternal trap and the last thing is that hell is avoidable it's avoidable there's three responses today to this message one is I'm so grateful for Jesus and I'm gonna tell my friends about it second one is holy cow I need to get saved and third one dude chill <laughs> all this is a joke and the religious way to try to manipulate an emotional response to a religious message may I remind you I want to speak to the, to the third group of maybe people today who you're not right with God if Jesus is to come today if you were to die today you don't know where you would spend eternity and maybe you, you have this wall because you went to a university and you heard a doctor 
a professor. Perhaps you can reconcile the scientific things in the Bible. Maybe you're one of those people, you got hurt by the church, you've seen the hypocrisy. A pastor has done something bad to your family member or maybe you've been in a place where Christians mistreated you or perhaps your father left you, never hugged you, never was there for you. Now you're bitter at God and everything and so and now you're mad and you're saying no I'm not gonna accept all of this and I'm, I don't believe God exists and and everything. The real reason people would reject Jesus Christ and his offer is not because there is not enough evidence scientifically it's because there is abundance of pride internally the real reason why people will go to hell is the same reason satan got kicked out of heaven it's pride satan did not get kicked out of in he from heaven because he smoked weed he did not get kicked out of heaven because he was sleeping with the secretary and because he was cheating on taxes or even because of murder. The reason why Satan got thrown down from heaven and will be thrown down into hell is because of pride. And today in my generation, pride masks itself under scientific things I cannot reconcile. The hypocrisy in the church. But this, you know, the church is not really speaking about the social stuff and, and all of that. You can say, oh, you know, you guys are not wearing masks and everything. You can hide pride behind anything you want. But I can tell you one thing. Is pride will do to you what it did to Satan. It will condemn you to hell because they condemned him to hell. If you have what Satan has, you'll go where Satan is going. It's only pride that will keep a sane person from rejecting the truth of Jesus, the offer of Jesus. He came to save you from sin. You are a criminal. You are the one that offended God. You are the one that deserve to burn in hell because of you were born in sin. It's our, hu it's our humanity to turn their back on God. We were the ones that ignored the flashlights. We were the ones that ignored and said, no, we're going to do our own way. And God comes on this earth and He becomes a man. He tries to tell us of the truth, takes our penalty upon Himself and puts all of these road spikes on our path and says, stop. There is an eternity I placed inside of you. Your life doesn't end when you die. I came to rescue you. I came to save you. I came and there is an evidence to all of that and then we will say no I don't really believe in that and it's not because we don't believe in that. It's that it's easier to be your own God than to fall from your throne, get on your knee and strip yourself of your pride and humble yourself. Because to need a savior you need to abandon pride. To need a savior, you need to stop acting like your own savior. You need to stop acting like your own God. That's why the chief sin that we all battle with is not the sin of smoking, drinking. It's the sin of idolatry and it will keep us away from Christ. Christ can forgive any sin but he will never forgive pride because pride doesn't even ask for forgiveness. And this person who will say no to Christ because of pride will be difficult to live with. A proud spouse is difficult to live with. It's difficult to work with because they're never wrong. It's everybody's always everybody's fault except their own. And I want to encourage you today that if you are here today and you are not, do not know where you will face, where you will spend eternity. If today you're listening and you heard about the message of Jesus Christ, maybe you went to mass as a child, maybe you heard about the Lord from this and from that from your friends, you are here today. Christ has a meeting with you. He interrupted my message just for you. I'm going to tell you one thing. It will be worth ruining your Christmas for your eternity. I really felt during worship today, God says, I am going to save so many people through this message in the years down the earth. In the years down, God wants to save you. He wants to rescue you. But you do have to do this one thing. You have to humble yourself. And you have to come and say, Jesus, I need help. You have to come off of your horse and get on your knees before Christ and say, Jesus, save me. From my sin, from my unrighteousness, I need your gift of salvation. Give me eternal life. That eternal life will give you abundant life. It will give you joyful life. It will give you every other thing but the most important thing is eternal life. I'm not a Christian because Christians are nice. I'm not a Christian 
because people around me aren't hypocrites. I'm not a Christian because the world is nice. I'm a Christian because I'm a wretched sinner who is going to face a holy God and His justice and I will fail. I will flunk that judgment and I do not want to take a chance and He already told me that I'm not good enough in myself and therefore I join Jesus. I go into Christ. I receive His abundant love and His forgiveness. He restores my dignity and my value. He gives me a new name. He doesn't make me a slave. He makes me a son. He adopts me. He makes me His own. And when I die, the last time my eyes see this world will be the first time my eyes see Him and that world. I will not be escorted by demons crouching, pulling me into Hades. I will be escorted by heaven's escort services. Angels will take me into heaven. My friend, let me ask you, what about you? Have you made Jesus the Lord of your life? Have you asked Him to come into your heart? Or are you hiding behind pride? Are you hiding behind drama? Or are you hiding behind sin? Imagine that person going through the railroad who's saying, oh, the reason why I'm going to ignore the flashlights and I'm going to go through, why? Because my mama beat me today. Are you crazy? People have been mean to me, so I'm just going to go ahead and ignore the flashing lights, my friend. No matter how people have treated you, it's never worth to throw your eternity over that. You need to accept Jesus Christ today. I plead with you. I beseech you by the mercies of God. Get right with God. Get right with Jesus today. Repent of your sin. Give your life entirely to Him. You will say, does that mean that I'm going to lose my fun? Some of it, yes. But what's fun today will become pain tomorrow. Christ will deliver you. He will restore you. He will give you new hope. Maybe you're here today and you say, but I've done so many bad things. Perhaps you've had an abortion. Maybe you've done things that you feel guilty about. I'm going to remind you one thing about Christ. He's way better at saving you than you are at sinning. He will forgive you. He died a brutal death to give you a radical salvation. He will restore you. He will forgive you of all of your sins and you will love Him deeply and you will treasure Him intimately. Today He is ready to do that. He is ready to give you a new heart and this can be the Christmas where not only you celebrated His birth, heaven celebrated yours. I want us to rise to our feet. If you're watching us on live stream or if you are here, as the team is going to sing, if you're not right with God, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, today I'm not going to make it easy. As they're going to sing, I'm going to ask you to come out of your seat and to meet me right here. I tremble preaching this message. You're going to tremble responding it. Jesus died publicly. The least we can do is to acknowledge Him publicly. To humble us because there are some of you, you got pride and you got to shake that off. And I'm not talking about responding to some scary message. I'm talking about responding to the truth and saying, Jesus, today you were born so that I will be born again. I rejoice at your birth so that heaven can rejoice at my second birth. If the Lord is pounding on your heart right now and you say, I need to get right with God, I'm going to ask you quickly come out of your seat. Come and stand with me right now. I'm going to pray with you that Jesus will come into your heart. If you brought a friend with you right now, as the worship team sings, you can bring him with you and we're going to pray. We're going to pray that the Lord is going to come into their heart. If you're watching us on live stream right now, begin to comments below. I would like to get right with God. I'm not there where I'm supposed to be with God. I'm repenting right now. I'm asking Jesus to come into my heart. And we're going to have our moderators. We'll pray with you in just a moment. Grace, wonderful grace, wonderful. Grace, wonderful grace. At the cross. All of my sins
I'm going to ask you to do something, a little evangelistic tool. Turn to your neighbor and say, do you need to get right with God? If they say yes, I want you to bring them to the front. Friends, don't let other friends go to eternity without Jesus. Right now, just take a moment. If you have a friend, you say, hey, if they're not right with the Lord, just come with them. Come with them. Don't drag, don't manipulate, don't push, but come with them. If they need to get right with the Lord, just bring them with you. We're going to pray in just a moment. Those of you on live stream on Zoom, I want you to get ready right now because in just a moment, we're going to pray this prayer. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to give us a brand new heart and give us a brand new life. For those of you that will be re-watching or re-listening this, God is about to touch your life in Jesus' name. Let's pray this prayer together right now. Say this out loud with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm a rebel. I'm a proud person. I'm a righteous person. I am in need of your salvation. Take this heart of mine and give me a new heart. Save my soul today. Write my name in your book of life. Change me from the inside out. Transform me. I need your mercy. Wash me with your blood. I surrender everything I am. Give me a new life. And from this day forward, I choose to follow you as you help me. In Jesus' name, amen.